Start basketball. Hi, this is Alex Sarama from Belgium, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads podcast. Hey, Hoop Heads. Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. And follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. That was a common response throughout all the times that I led a meditation session at a camp was, that was so awesome. When can we do that again? Mike Lee is the founder of MindShift Labs and Thrive3. Bridging his background in basketball leadership and performance, training some of basketball's 1% with mindfulness and emotional intelligence. Mike helps high-performing leaders master the psychology needed to perform and lead in a 2020 world. Through his experience building an international basketball brand from his college apartment and growing it while beating the heroin-like withdrawal symptoms of pharmaceutical medication, Mike understands the challenges leaders face. Drawing on the latest research from neuroscience, basketball, and personal experience, he shared stories and practical exercises across the United States, Indonesia, and Spain to help people find their own inner power and poise to thrive in business and in life. Mike is the founder of Thrive3, a basketball training company that creates game-changing experiences that cross over from the court to life. At Thrive3, he's worked at academies or individual development sessions with players like NBA MVP Stephen Curry, All-Star Joel Embiid, and Rookie of the Year Malcolm Brogdon. Mike is also the author of the internationally sold book, Untrain. We have Hoopheads Pod webinars coming up with NBA shooting coach Dave Love and Tyler Whitcomb from West Michigan Aviation Academy. And if you missed any of our previous webinars, you can buy the replay for just $4.99 on the Hoopheads Pod website. If you're focused on improving your coaching and your team, we've got you covered. Visit hoopheadspod.com slash webinars to get registered. Make sure you check out our new Hoopheads Pod network of shows, including Thrive with Trevor Huffman, Beyond the Ball, the CoachMaze.com podcast, Players Court, and our first three team-focused NBA pods, Cavaliers Central, Grizz and Grind, and Nuck if you buck. Looking for more NBA podcasters interested in hosting their own show centered on a particular team? Reach out to me at mike at hoopheadspod.com if you're interested in learning more and bringing your talent to our network. Get ready to improve your mindset and grow as a leader as you listen to this episode with Mike Lee from MindShift Labs and Thrive3. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel and tonight we are pleased to welcome from MindShift Labs, Mike Lee. Mike, welcome. Thanks for having me on, guys. Absolutely. We are excited to have you on, dive into what's been a very interesting career for you, both in basketball and now shifting into the corporate speaking, mindfulness, and just trying to make the people that you come in contact with be more successful. So let's start, though, with basketball when you were a kid. Tell us a little bit about how you got into the game when you were younger. A couple memories stand out, and the first one was watching the Bulls play the Lakers in the 91 finals. So that would give you an idea of how old I am. And I just remember watching Jordan play and just his, his demeanor on the court and his competitiveness. And that just inspired me to want to wanna play the game and to want to put the time in and put the work in. And, and that was really the first thing. And then that led to falling in love with the Fab Five and Jalen Rose and the Black Sox and the Parachis and the Baggy Shorts and 
that uh, and then everything else is is a mediocre basketball career. <laughs> so um, that's really where it all started, though. I just I fell in love with Jordan, I fell in love with the Fab Five, and you know had a, a very very average high school career. Played a little bit of Division three basketball uh, at. University of Wisconsin, stout, small division three school, actually a big division three school, but a small college in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin. And that was, that was really my playing career. No, no overseas pro journey, anything like that at all. Did you have any thought as you were playing that at some point you wanted to get into coaching, training, or was that something that once your playing career came to an end that – you said, hey, I still want to stay involved in the game. How did the idea for becoming a coach, a basketball trainer, where did that hit you? It's funny you should say that because I remember specifically writing a paper. I don't know how old I was. I feel like it was, it must have been in high school because I remember that we had to write a paper on our career choices and basically do research on a, on a career field that we wanted to to take on as an adult. And my paper that I wrote, I got had to get like special approval for it, I think is what I remember. But it was to be a college basketball coach. And I had Billy Donovan on the on the cover of it, on my on my cover page. So that had to have been, and it was early Billy Donovan. So yeah, I think he was maybe his first year at Florida or something like that. I probably didn't even really know who he was, but uh, it was a it was that that was really the first time that I I remember it being a being a possibility. The kind of the backstory was I I knew that I wanted to do something in basketball. I knew I didn't. I, that's that was going to be my life. I knew I wanted to do something in it, but I went to school actually to be, a, to be a high school art teacher and a high school basketball coach. That's what I initially thought going into college. And that shifted to psychology because I just got bored of art history classes and things like that. that you have to take. <laughs> but I, yeah, I mean, as back as, as early as high school, it was real, whenever I wrote that paper was when I thought it was a possibility. And uh, go ahead. No, so thinking about the psychology piece of it, was the idea then still to teach and coach or was the idea to shift to doing something within the field of psychology? The idea was to graduate college. I just, I couldn't find anything that I really wanted to do. And I knew that my path was not going to be a traditional path. I wasn't going to be a doctor or a, an attorney or a graphic designer. It just I wasn't going to have a, a traditional path. So I knew if I wanted to go to college basketball at that time, one of the big, and it still kind of is, but one of the, the paths is to get a GA job. So I thought, okay, I can go to school. Psychology is interesting to me at least. I can learn about this. I can go to grad school, get a degree in sports psychology, and then use that as leverage to get a GA job, to move into coaching in the college basketball ranks. So that was kind of the thought process behind that. And so when you went to go and pursue that, what did that pursuit look like for you? Was that something that ended up being harder than you thought? Just Describe what the process was for you trying to take that next step. Do you mean initially starting to try and coach in college? Yeah. What was it like? What did you do? Yeah. Did you start sending? You start sending out letters? Did you call people? What was the process like? I never got to that point, and I guess this kind of speaks to my knowing that I wasn't going to take a traditional path. I initially coached one year at the school that I went to. It was my last year in school and I was finishing up and our coach asked me to, to be an assistant coach and basically to do scouting reports and run individual workouts. And that was kind of my, my first 
my first dive into coaching college basketball. So I did that for a year and I got probably towards the end of the first year. And I, I just, I wanted to, there's no knock on division three basketball. I was a division three basketball player, but I wanted to work. I didn't want to start over every year. In, in reality, division three basketball is basically glorified high school basketball. You can't work with the guys from, you know, March until October. You basically can't talk to them. So you're almost starting over every single year. And I knew that wasn't for me. I wanted to do something where I could develop d- deeper relationships and have more of an impact on the, on the people that I was spending time with, the players that I was spending time with. And so one of my assistant coaches had, he basically approached me and said, have you ever thought about coaching AAU? Because at the time I was... I was coaching college basketball, I was finishing school, and I was building this basketball training company. And we hadn't started AAU yet. And he had a, a, a college teammate, former college teammate that had a son who was in seventh grade, actually sixth grade, but seventh grade. And they were looking to put together a team because at that time where I was living, you basically had to live in Milwaukee or Madison to have an opportunity to play on an AAU team or you had to drive three, four hours just to get to a practice. So what year was that, Mike? About what year? 2005. Gotcha. Okay. So that, so my, the way he kind of sold it to me, it really wasn't something that I wanted to do, but what he said was go and coach, coach AAU, build an AAU program when these kids who are in seventh grade get to be ninth grade, 10th grade, and they start to get recruited, you're going to go develop all these relationships with these coaches, and that's going to be a way better in for you than going to be in a GA somewhere. I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Plus, it sounds like it's going to be a lot more enjoyable than coaching Division three and, and just doing laundry and cleaning the floors and doing all that stuff. I'm actually going to get real reps coaching recruiting. I mean, I recruited kids in seventh grade, like I was a division one college coach. I was writing them, le- I was writing them handwritten letters. I was sending them apparel in the mail. I was, you know, I didn't pay them, but uh, I did pretty much everything I possibly could do. And so I got a ton of great experience doing that, but that was really the, the end of the college basketball coaching journey was I did that the AU program for about three years and I realized I just didn't want to book hotel rooms and schedule tournaments and fundraise. I just wanted to be on the court working with players and I, I let that program go. I handed it over to somebody else and they now have like 80 teams or something crazy like that. Um, and I, I transitioned strictly to individual skill development in camps. Did you think at all about or miss when you thought about being a college coach? Because obviously on the player development side, the part of coaching that doesn't exist there for you is the team concept, the X's and O's and those kinds of things sort of disappear off the table. So was that something that you missed? You miss something that you were like, yeah, that part of the game doesn't really fascinate me as much as the ability to impact players and build those deeper relationships that you talked about earlier. I definitely missed it. There's nothing like the journey of the season. And when you're doing individual workouts, you're pretty much doing the same thing every single day. And so that, that sometimes would get monotonous, no doubt about it. But what I fill those gaps with were we would do coaches clinics. So we would have a little bit of a different uh, different dynamic there, which I absolutely love doing. We would run our our coaches clinics in Milwaukee and we'd have coaches from literally all over the country that would come out as amazing and have to be a different uh, way to share what we were doing. Um, But I definitely missed that that journey of the season and those relationships that you build and the adversity that you go through and the, the, just the deep impact that you can have on somebody. I definitely miss that. I mean, I literally still talk to the kids and I coach on that seventh grade team today. Uh, it's been awesome to see what they're doing. And they've Absolutely, stayed in sure. One of them is an assistant coach for the Hawks, another kid coach for the Raptors. 
So it's been cool to see their them kind of continue the journey on from what we started with them. So when you look at building a business and you think about how you developed your basketball training business, does it go back to that seventh grade team and starting the AAU program? Is that the main way that you were able to grow your clientele and build it into a business that you could do full time? Or were there other pieces and parts to it when you look at it from a business standpoint rather than just a strictly basketball standpoint? Yeah, there's a couple things to that because I actually started running camps five years, well, four, four to five years prior to that. A buddy of mine who was, he was actually a senior in high school at this time, and me, wanted to, I was as after my sophomore in college, we just wanted to put on a summer basketball camp in our hometown. We just thought it'd be fun to do. So we organized a camp. We, I remember this vividly. I, I, designed a flyer in Microsoft Word. I printed it on my mom's computer. I just drove all around around town and, and sent emails out and put it up at banks on the on the uh, on the court board. And we just wanted to do it. We thought it'd be fun. We wanted to do things a little differently. We hired a DJ to come in and DJ at camp so kids could request songs and the energy would always be high at camp. Um, and that was the first time that we really ever did anything. That was in 2003, and we had close to 100 kids that showed up in a town of 12,000 people in the middle of nowhere in central Wisconsin. And by the third year, we had close to 300 kids there. We had kids driving in from all over the place. Um, and I wasn't actually even running, directing the camp at the time. We had we had a couple other local high school coaches who were mentors to, to me and to this other partner that I had running the camps. So that was really when it first started was we just decided to do it. We thought it would be fun. And it was, obviously it was a lot of work, but it was something that was, we were providing something that definitely filled a need in that space at that time. And it obviously showed what the numbers that it but as far as the, the AAU program goes, yeah, I mean, no question about it that having some of these kids and developing those relationships help build the business. I mean, I don't know how it is in Ohio and the rest of the country, but the, the state association in Wisconsin is incredibly, uh, they're very organized almost to a fault where they uh, can be very, uh, you know, it's almost like the NCAA, right? There, basically, my point is we couldn't use any of these kids in any of our promotional stuff, right? Because absolutely. They, kids got there were other kids that got suspended and other other issues that that happened. But definitely, had, you know, we had a kid that was Gator Player of the Year, he played at Virginia. There's, uh, you know, other kids that are you know, the, another kid who's playing for the Raptors right now. So, like having those kids definitely, definitely helped. I mean, nobody cares if you're the best basketball trainer in the world and you're working out a kid who's just trying to play JV basketball from an external standpoint, like nobody cares. So it's incredibly difficult to build a business in that space uh, if you don't have higher level players that you've been able to help out and help them improve your game. Yeah, I think that that's something that when we've talked to different people who have built basketball training businesses, I think there's all there's different sort of, I don't know if philosophies is even the right word, but I do think that there is something to be said for when you have players who go on to have success that have been a part of your business, whether that's you know going on and playing Division One college basketball or guys that make it to play in the NBA or overseas or whatever, and then you can put that on your resume, you can put that on your website, you can put that for people to be able to see that certainly does bring in and attract clientele. And I think it's interesting, as you said, that someone could be a fantastic, unbelievable trainer. And yet at the same time, because of who their clientele is, it may never get recognized. And I think what, what I've found is that there's a, there's a direct connection 
between people who are really successful in the training business and those who aren't. And I think it's when you marry your ability to be a great trainer and do all the things that that entails, which we can talk about. But then I also think there's a piece of it that being able to promote yourself and have connections and understand how to market is a huge piece of who ends up building a full-time thriving business and who ends up just kind of doing it on the side for 50 bucks an hour here and there. I, do you agree yeah. with that? 100%. You're, I mean, at the end of the day, you're running a business. I mean, I, I definitely, I mean, I'd be willing to bet that I spent 70% of my time running my business and 30% of, 30% of it on the actual court. He's doing all the back end stuff, the YouTube videos, the email marketing, the content. I mean, you're running a business. It's it, it's really what it comes down to. And so that's did you like that's doing a huge that part of it? Did you like doing that stuff? I mean, was that something that once you, maybe you didn't think you know, like if you went back two three years before you started your business, you may not have been like, wow, I can't wait to start making. YouTube videos of my basketball training or running email marketing. But once you got into it and you're working by yourself, working for yourself as an entrepreneur, was that something that you started to enjoy more and feel like, Hey, this is something that I really like to do. Or was that a necessary evil to get you back out on the court? How did you look at it? At first I was resistant to it. I wanted nothing to do with business, believe it or not. I didn't even want to build a website. When we first started, I can't remember why, but I just think I had a, I probably had some experiences where I got in my head that business equals, basically business equals making money and making money is not moral in some way, shape or form. I don't know where that came from, but that's something that was definitely, something along those lines is definitely planted into my subconscious. But once I got going, I loved it. I mean, obviously, like I, I talked about before, I had a degree in psychology. So I knew nothing about what it was like to run an actual business. And I had to learn it all by making a, a ton of mistakes and trying new things and making more mistakes and not knowing that I... <laughs> I mean, here's an example. So... When I was in high school and college, I basically worked, I never really, I worked at like the YMCA and GNC. And other than that, I just worked at summer basketball camps, summer running or working summer basketball camps in my job, right? So pretty much any time I ever got paid my entire life, they had took the, the, you know, your taxes are taken out of your paycheck, right? When you go, when you're working for somebody else and it's there and it shows like whatever, 23 point five or whatever it is, right? So my, my first year in business, I, I literally didn't think that I had to pay taxes because I was, I was self-employed. I was like, well, they're not taking the taxes out of the checks that these people are giving me. It's so like, I, I, I don't have to pay taxes on it. So I go at the end of the year and I do my, do my taxes or whatever. I remember one, this, the first time this happened, I don't remember, I don't remember exactly the whole story, but the first year that this happened, I, it was like $10,000 that I owed or something. Like that. <laughs> and I think what it was, was I was like, I got to the end of the year and I was like, holy cow, I'm running my own business. I got $10,000 in savings at the end of the summer, like, you know, cause summer's your big, big time at, at, at that time. People weren't doing much outside the summer, and I'm like, I, you know, I got ten thousand dollars here, whatever it is. And they're like, Oh, you actually owe you, have, you know, you have to pay taxes, right? <laughs> so that all the money's all the money was obviously uh, gone and That's given funny. to federal doing, government. But you doing, so that, were you doing your own taxes at that point? Uh, yeah. I mean, so how um, long was yeah. how long how long was it before you hired an accountant to figure all that out for you? Well. And it went in stages. I mean, I, I realized that I actually had to do it, do my taxes. And yep. I started to do my own bookkeeping and everything like that. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, that was one of the biggest oh, things for so. me. That was one of the things for me. Like it took me, took me a couple of years when I started my camp business and I would run it. And for a while, for the first couple of years I did it, I don't even think I was, I wasn't even incorporated. So I was just running it through me and then I was doing my own taxes on TurboTax. And then once yeah. I, once I became incorporated, then you start looking at the corporate tax forms. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think that this is going to make a whole lot of sense for me to do that. And then kind of like you, those first couple of years, you know, I made my income in the summertime and then the tax bill would come due and, you know, it would, it would be what it was. And there was always me owing some money. And then yeah. once I, once I sat down and met with the accountant and started really looking at what I could deduct and what I couldn't deduct and all those things, it suddenly went from, I was owing money every year to, I was getting a refund back every year. And I'm like, I don't, whatever I'm spending on, <laughs> whatever I'm spending on my accountant is well worth it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, 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 definitely. That's you take one takeaway from podcasts is you start your own business, find somebody who knows what they're doing with finances. Absolutely, there's no question <laughs> about that. That that's that's probably the most valuable takeaway we've ever had on the Hoopheads Pod, right there. <laughs> get a, get, a, get an accountant, get a team of people that's going to help you to navigate what you're doing if you have your own business. There's no doubt about it. All right, so you talked a little bit about some of the things that were a challenge, and then I wanted to ask. So let's ask the question this way. What was something that was your biggest challenge when it came to building your training business? And then conversely, what's something that you did that worked really well that helped you build your business? Good question. I would say the number one, the, the biggest challenge, well, I had a couple of them. I think at first, I... I had no, I didn't have a name. Like I had no playing career. I didn't play. I didn't play Division One basketball. I didn't play at Duke or Marquette or didn't play anywhere. I didn't even have a Division Three name, right? So the hardest thing was, and maybe not the hardest thing, but but if you, and basically this is a, a teaching point for somebody is, if you don't have a name, you one hundred percent have to be able to demonstrate better than the players that you're working out. You have to. And that was the only way that we were able to get buy-in and build credibility with higher level players was because we could actually demonstrate the skills that we were teaching. We weren't just a talking head showing you a video or walking you through something. It's like, we could do this at game speed, show you a, uh, a game speed demonstration of exactly what it's supposed to look like. So I think that was one of the challenges, especially when I wanted to start working out higher level guys, was how do I get them to believe that I can actually help them? So I think that's that's one thing. And I mean, I I I still would go through workouts probably for my first six, seven years, probably out of college, still, I mean, I wouldn't work out like full on workout. Like I used to, but I would definitely still go through drills and get reps in and practice demonstrating drills and, and practice demonstrating moves so that I was able to show up for the, the players when we were on court together. So that, that was one thing. Second thing would be second thing would be not having a consistent facility when we first started. When you're when you're starting out and you're, you're driving all over town, you're driving to kids' uh, driveways into the park into a, a buddy's condo that's got a you know, quarter size court right, right. In, in his condo to work out a kid that's got one light in it, and, and you're just driving all over the place without having a consistent facility and consistent location. It's incredibly difficult to build a consistent following a consistent client base. So what we did that worked incredibly well was we went to a school that basically didn't, it was an old school. It was actually a school that one of our a parents, one of the kids we were working out, we went to grade school there. And it was a long time ago, an old Catholic school in Milwaukee. And they had turned it into a charter school, and they basically didn't have sports anymore. And they used the gym for gym class, and that was basically about it. I mean, they had some sports stuff, but it was like basically intermural. It was a 
very, very low level competitive teams, right? So we went to them and we said, hey, we'll put in a brand new floor and we'll rent it out. You won't have to, so you can make, make money uh, for, your, for your charter school and we'll rent it out. We'll put a brand new floor in here for you. So that's how we got into getting our own facility. And it basically costs us about 10% of what market value would have been to build out our own facility, build out a warehouse space or something like that. So that was huge for us because we were looking into building our own facility, which I'm sure a lot of guys, if you're starting out a business or, or you're, uh, you're have been going and you're getting so many clients and you're running out of space, you're driving all over the time, you're like, I want, everybody wants their own gym, right? It's just easier. And, but the hard part is look, for us, I didn't want to get into, I didn't want to be in the athletic facility business. I wanted to be working guys out. I didn't want to be renting it out to retirement homes at 11 a.m. to, to 1 p.m. because we need to make, right, make our, our mortgage payment, right? Absolutely. So that was what worked for us. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of school districts that have schools that are just closed down and they got a gym in there. And it's probably an old, you know, tartan floor gym, or it's a terrible wood floor that's on top of concrete. And you might be able to work something out with the school. I mean, I, I don't think there's any school district in the country that isn't looking for more income. So you go to one of these schools that's just shut down. And there was, there was a couple other ones just in Milwaukee that we were looking at that were completely shut down and weren't in use. And it might be an option for somebody. So once you got that open, how much training were you doing and then at what point would did you start to bring in other people to work under your underneath your umbrella once you had the facility open i actually had guys working with me before we even opened it up and the reason i did that was i just didn't want to build this by myself i i wanted to have other people that were on board that believed in what we were doing and and I knew that if I was ever going to build anything close to what I could visualize, I was never going to do it alone. And I, we, so we had guys before we even started, the, even before we had our own facility. So where did those and, guys come yeah, from? Where did those guys come from? Yeah, they were, well, one guy, I, got from a camp that he just came and worked at. He came and worked at camp. He was a guy who was with me for, for 10 years. I came and worked at camp uh, right out of college, did a great job. He ended up moving to Milwaukee to essentially work with me and uh, right out of college. And he started doing workouts and, and stay on board and it, it paid off for him. So I had people right away. I just knew that even though I didn't, like, I really didn't need him. I was basically giving up something on the front end because I knew that I was going to need somebody who knew what they were doing, somebody that I could trust, somebody that was going to do a great job eventually down the road. And I was willing to give up workouts, give up something financially in the future or to invest in the future. And so we had, we had him on. And I think at one point, the most, the most we ever had on staff, full time or part time, was seven guys, six or seven guys. When you first brought on a new person and yep. you started having to give your clientele to this new person, how difficult was that transition for you to be able to give those clients to somebody else and have the trust that they were going to do the job? that you knew you would personally do. That's the first piece of it. And then the second piece of it is, how did you get your clients, who I'm sure initially are attracted to you and what you're doing, how did you transition from it being Mike Lee basketball trainer to Mike Lee basketball, where you might be working with Mike Lee basketball, but you might not be working with Mike Lee? How did you go about making that leap? Because I think that's an area where you see a lot of individual trainers 
struggling with the idea of building a business beyond themselves. They have trouble visualizing how that happens. Yeah. And the number one thing is build the brand around the collective versus the individual. And I think if you can understand that concept, that's going to take you a long ways. Uh, you also got to, you got to give up control. You have to allow the, you got to be humble enough to allow new possibilities, new opportunities, people to come in and maybe share a viewpoint that's different from yours, that is going to add value. Um, I, I, I definitely, you got to give them, you got to give them room to make mistakes. You have to make it safe enough for them psychologically for them to fail. And unless they are, unless they feel psychologically safe to try new things, to be creative, to, uh, to be able to demonstrate in front of people and not be worried about what you're going to say to them or, or if you're going to make a mistake or if they're going to make a mistake. I think from a leadership perspective, that's something that, that's huge. You just have to create that safe space for them so that they can grow into the person that you know that they are, are going to be able to grow into. And without that, it's incredibly difficult to build something beyond yourself. Yeah, I would have to think that when you're bringing somebody on, that giving them the opportunity to be able to stretch themselves and to be able to test out new things and to be able to use their own style. Because again, not every coach, not every trainer we know has the same style of interacting with players or just the way that they go about teaching. Everybody does it a little differently. Did you have a training method, a training manual that you would sort of go through with anybody that was a new hire? Or was it more that you were very familiar with these guys and their work prior to you bringing them on? What was the process like for vetting them and making sure that they were going to represent your brand the way that you wanted it to be represented? Yeah. So that is one thing that I would not flex on. I would not, I would not flex on methodology and it's more so the framework of it not necessarily what you taught but how you taught and we had yeah i mean we had when you came on board you had to take a written test you had to do an on-court test you had to come and observe workouts you had to uh, you had to run work part of workouts so we give you the first 10 minutes of a workout to run. And then the next time you come in, you have to run 15 minutes of a workout. And then you build up to you were running your own sessions. But there was definitely a process to make sure that there was brand integrity, experience integrity with every session that we did with the new hires that we brought on. A big thing that stood out to us was what was really helpful was if a kid had worked out with us and they went on to play college basketball, that transition from being a college basketball player and working out with us to becoming a trainer with us was really a, a pretty seamless transition. But if we had somebody who came on that didn't, uh, didn't work out with us, didn't play college basketball, it was pretty much impossible to train somebody to run a workout at the level that we needed to, to run it at to maintain brand integrity. So having somebody that played college basketball was, was a, almost a prerequisite. You just, you had to, it's just the level of, of understanding of the game and coaching is just significant. That no matter what level it is, division three, division two, division one, whatever it is, that uh, that just the knowledge of the game is so different, so much more in depth. So you mentioned your methodology and having that be one thing that you didn't waver on. So tell us a little bit about what your methodology was, what you built your training philosophy on, what your workouts looked like, what you wanted them to look like, what kind of skills you were teaching and obviously we're not going to get down to the micro level and start talking what drills you did or didn't do, but just maybe an overarching philosophy of what you tried to do when you first brought a player into your training facility. What was it that you were trying to accomplish with them? 
Well, a few things. Number one, we did not have a cookie cutter program where a kid came in and day one you do this, day two you do this, day three you do this. We never wanted it to be, we always wanted our, our sessions to be timely and relevant based on what that player needed in the moment, based on what they wanted to achieve, based on the player that they wanted to encounter. So we never had any sort of cookie cutter program or anything like that. Uh, the other, a couple other things. I mean, one thing where we saw a lot of kids being held back and not necessarily. You know, one thing that we prided ourselves on where our workouts were efficient. Like you came in and every rep was intentional. Every rep was efficient. And so what I mean by that is, is I think a mistake that a lot of trainers make is they will teach, basically, they'll teach a kid how to split a ball screen before he even has a great crossover. And so if a kid doesn't have a great crossover, he's never going to be able to split a ball screen. So one of our philosophies was skills before situations. We would always want to make sure that they, they had the skills down to be able to perform in the situation. It's like, uh, you know, it's like a... A kid that can't pass off the dribble or just doesn't have very great vision uh, as, as a point guard or as a guard, right? And a coach expecting them to, to make uh, passes and make reads that he doesn't even have the skills to make. And so that was a big thing was the skills before the situations. And then once they had the skills down, then... Every single other thing that we did had to be a extrapolated from the game. So we had, there was no, like, this is a cliche example, but like three man weave, uh, doing ball wraps around your right leg, left leg, big great stuff like that. Unless, you know, we were 15 years ago running a first grade camp. Like you're never doing anything like that. Everything had to be, you had to be able to pull it out of the game and that we would just, our, our drills were basically, every single drill that we did was a two-second piece of the game, a three-second piece of the game, a four-second piece of the game, repeated over and over and over again. So those are some of the things that, that we tried to, to build our, our methodology around. Did you, did you utilize film, either film of the actual players that you were working with or studying film of NBA and college guys to – figure out the footwork and the different things that they were doing in order to be able to execute plays and moves out on the floor. Just talk a little bit about whether or not that was something that you incorporated into your, into your training. Yes. On both levels, me personally, and also in our events, we would, we'd watch film, we'd have film study. We'd have film study of dribble moves. We'd have film study of finishing moves. We'd have film study of ball screen reads different uh, different game action. So that's definitely something. And the other thing is, you know, obviously all that came from me watching the game and Luke watching the game and other other coaches watch. I mean I used to watch I don't anymore, but I used to watch I mean I used to watch a lot of NBA basketball. A lot of NBA basketball. I mean whenever uh Kenny and Charles and Ernie were on that I was on. So um <laughs> It, anytime, anytime the NBA was on, I wanted to watch it. Because I think, you know, I, I firmly, like, once you have an in-depth understanding of basketball, there's nothing like the NBA. Everybody says, oh, college basketball is so pure, and this and that. It's like, when you really watch the skill level and basketball IQ of college basketball players on a whole, it's not that great. <laughs> so yeah, compared to the NBA, compared to the NBA, for sure, there's no question about that. It, yeah, and when you just and there's just a beauty to it. It's uh, it's just such a beautiful game. It's a, a creative. The way I look at it is like it, it's just such a creative work of art. So like the, watching the Warriors play when they were just clicking, right? It's just unbelievable. To watch the ball movement and the spacing and the skill level and the IQ was just incredible. It was like watching a painting being painted on a basketball court. And so I think 
we and what we tried to do then was we would take okay, what does what's what's a concept that Steph Curry uses that gives him the ability to play at the level that he plays at, being a very below average NBA athlete. And it's like how does he understand angles? How does he change speeds? How does he uh, how does his ball focus, his ability to pass off the dribble, all these skills that he would use, we would try to break them down so that other kids could use them. Like one of them is the concept we use called mirroring, where but it's basically uh, like you know Chris Paul started doing it years and years and years ago. So, but with uh, uh, snaking back off a ball screen. Well, you can teach kids to do that without a ball screen. And once they beat the guy off the dribble, now that they recover that something, Steph does I mean, most NBA guards are great at it now, but uh, back then, that was a new thing. Nobody was really doing that. So like being able to pull those things out and then break them down into simple, easy to learn steps so that middle school and high school kids could apply those to the game was, was huge that we got from watching them. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I think that when we've talked to trainers who have been successful, both from a business standpoint and with their clients, I think that the film piece of it becomes really, really important because it does allow you to see what the best players in the NBA or the college level, what they're doing. And then, as you said, I loved how you talked about breaking it down to a level where you can take something that Chris Paul or Steph Curry does, and yet you can still teach it to a kid who's in middle school and is 13 years old by simplifying it and breaking it down into the smallest pieces so that you can actually teach it. Because it's one thing to be able to watch it. It's even one thing for yourself to be able to do it. It's another thing to be able to teach it. And I think, I think that's what the best skills trainers, the best high school coaches, the best AAU coaches, whatever whatever level you're talking about, the best coaches just have an ability to teach and make it clear to their players what it is that they want them to do and how they want them to do it. And that allows their players to have success both within the workout and then clearly that's going to transfer into their performance out on the court, which is ultimately what both sides, the player, their parents, the trainer, their high school coach, their college coach wants to see is that the skills that are being performed in a workout translate into the game. Right, 100%. And I think the reality of it is, is a lot of it doesn't. And I, you know, I've seen and heard and watched the workouts, like a lot of it doesn't actually translate, and it kind of blows my mind. But the teaching aspect of it, you're right, is, is so huge. I mean, I, I was incredibly fortunate to work summer basketball camps for some of the best teachers I've ever been around. Uh, he was, there's a guy, you maybe would know him. Here's, here's a perfect example we were talking about earlier about the business side of this training business, the basketball business. I used to work summer basketball camps for a guy named Forrest Larson. And I don't know if you know the name at all. I do um, not know that name. He... He is the best teacher of the game I have ever been around in my entire life. It's not even close. I mean, I've seen Duke practice. I've seen North Carolina practice. I've seen UCLA. I mean, I've seen I've seen uh, Patino run workouts at Five Star. Like, I've seen the best of the best of the best, and nobody comes close to this guy. But... Nobody knows who he, who he is. I shouldn't say nobody, but like very few people know who he is because he didn't put that time in on the on the business side of it. He just hated it. He didn't want anything to do with it. But I was able to learn so much from him as a as a college player and, and a little bit out of college about how to break the game down, how to teach the game, and I would have never been able to do anything that I, I did without that experience is him and my college coach was an unbelievable teacher of the game. Uh, they used to go, so what Forrest used to do is he used to go out, I believe out to, to Pennsylvania to watch John Miller 
do the workouts. And that's where he really started to pick stuff up. And he'd go watch John Miller do workouts and he'd go watch uh, he'd go watch Patino run practice back in the early nineties when he was at Kentucky. Uh, like the, and that's where he he picked up a lot of drills and stuff from. But he was an unbelievable teacher of the game, unlike any anybody I've ever seen or been around that time. All right, let's start talking a little bit about how, obviously, with your psychology background, you've already always been interested in the human mind and how it works. When did you start to incorporate the mindfulness, the psychology piece of it into what you were doing on the basketball floor? And then that can kind of lead us into our transition into what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, basically, the short story is... I grew up in Wisconsin, lived in Wisconsin pretty much uh, my entire life up to about 32, 33 years old. And I used to get incredibly depressed in the winters. And it just got to a point where I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to do another winter. And I just decided to move to Los Angeles purely for the weather. I got out here. I decided it was sunny out. It was January. I was feeling way better than I ever felt in the winter before. (laughs) <laughs> and then I decided to get off of this antidepressant medication that I've been on for 14 years. Well, getting off of it was like getting off of heroin. It was insane what I went through uh, over the course of a couple of years trying to get off of this medication. And one of the big things was that I just couldn't get present. I, my mind was just all over the place. And I was just experiencing incredibly low depressions, like way, <laughs> way way worse than I'd ever felt in Wisconsin and just crazy anxiety. Uh, and the only the way that I got off of it was I decided to commit to a meditation practice. And I sat down and I meditated every single day for a couple months to start out. And after a couple months on the good days, I realized that, wow, all the skills that I'm teaching from the mental performance side of the game of basketball and the leadership skills and using a run my little company, everything's elevated. I can focus better, I'm better developing relationships, I'm more empathetic, I'm a better listener, I can block out distractions better. And I was like, I gotta start teaching this at our at our camps. And so I start I wrote a book on it and I started to teach meditation at our, at our camps. I remember the first time that I did it, I was super hesitant to do it because I was like, <laughs> in Moorhead, Minnesota, which is uh, right by right by Fargo, so I'm in, in small town with a bunch of kids in northern Minnesota, and like, I don't know how they're going to take this, but I know they, I know they, they got to do it. Like, this is, this sort of changed the game for me. And so I took them through a session, and you know, lots of, we ran pretty demanding camps. And so there was a, a whole lot of times in, over the course of 15 years where a kid came up to me after a drill and said, hey, can we do that again later? And that was, that was one thing that, what, that was a common response throughout all the times that I, I led a meditation session at a camp was, that was so awesome. When can we do that again? And so I knew it was kind of odd to something with that because the kids that we're working with, they've only grown up in a world of technology and a world where their parents plan every single activity for them from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And they don't have that time to shut off. And so it gave, gave them permission to do that. And I think that was something that was uh, – that, that was – definitely beneficial for them to, to have an experience with. I mean, I don't think it's, it's definitely not for everybody, um, but if you want to level up your performance and you want to be at the 1% of the 1% and the Steve Jobs of the world and the Kobe Bryant's and the, and the uh, operate at that level, uh, the science is undeniable about how it changes your brain and what it can do for you from a performance standpoint. Tell us about your book and where the idea, the thought first came to you that you should put this book together to be able to impact people, not just in sports, but in business and in their life 
just tell us a little bit about how you went through that process, maybe where the idea first came from, and then what it was like to write that book. Well, I knew I always wanted to write a book, but I, I, ever since I started reading, like, the pioneers of the pop psychology stuff, like the Napoleon Hill and the Jim Rome and uh, Dennis Waitley and some of these guys that were, like, in the 80s, I started reading a bunch of stuff because they were... Well, they had a lot of excerpts in a magazine called Success Magazine that I started writing, or reading um, a long time ago. But I, so I always knew I wanted to write a book. Uh, but I was just like, I don't have anything to share. I don't have, like, I'm young. I'm 30, 32, 33 years old. I don't have anything to share right now. Like, who's going to listen to me? And I had a, a, a friend of mine who had written a book. And that kind of, he, he encouraged me to write it. His name is Joshua Metcalf. He probably... Yes, stuff, chocolate, sure. water, really cool. Anyways, he was the he, he encouraged me to write it. He said, you know, he's like, you got you have something to share, you need to write this. And so I did, and it was really just my initial goal with it was I wanted to get this out to high school basketball coaches and players and and to to teachers and to and really the education space was really that was my space that I had connections in and that was kind of the only world that I knew. And that was really the intention of writing. It was really just I there wasn't much in the market on meditation or on uh, sports performance from that standpoint. And I just wanted to get something out there. So in the process of writing the book, did the audience who the book was intended for, did that morph and change at all as you went through the process of actually sitting down and doing the writing? If I'm understanding your question correctly, not really. I, you know, that, that was something that in all honesty was not really part of my process. It was more so, here's, a, here's something that helped me. Here's a story about it. Here's how you can apply it to your life. Here's how you can apply it to basketball. Here's how you can apply it to leadership. And that was really the process. It was just, what are the principles I want to share? The overarching theme is around using mindfulness to optimize performance in sports, business, and life. And what are the stories, the principles, and the, the exercises that I can share to support that? You don't really think about audience a whole lot because so many the I mean, I shouldn't say so many, every single principle that's in the book is universal. If you're a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or you're a high school principal or you're, you're a stay-at-home parent, all the principles apply. All right. So did the writing of the book, did that start to get you to think about wanting to transition a little bit away from strictly being the basketball training guy and get more into the depth of mindfulness and start to transition into what you're doing today. Yeah, definitely. I think one big thing, one big realization that I had was diving into the book was that I wanted more of my life to be about building people versus building basketball players. That was a big realization that I had with it. Um, and I also had a college friend who had been doing corporate speaking pretty much his, his entire, entire life after college. And he was able to give you some insights as to the industry and some starting points and people to talk to, questions to ask, and, and, and how to break into that space. Uh, and having conversations with him about what he was doing and the work that he was doing and the, the process of it and the, just what his life was like, really from a lifestyle standpoint, uh, was something that was intriguing to me. So you would and say I that always. 
And I guess one thing that I skipped over was one of my absolute favorite things to do when I was in the basketball world was to speak at coaches' clinics. Whether it was the Wisconsin Basketball Coaches Association, New York Association, wherever it was, I love speaking in front of bigger groups. And I knew that this was a way for me to, to do that more, an opportunity to do that more. And so that, that was another driving force behind the transition was something that I loved to do in the basketball space, just being in a different industry. All right. So you're going to make this transition and you're thinking about taking the leap. Would you say that having the mentor there to talk to, to be able to bounce ideas off of and questions, was that a big key to you being able to make the transition? I don't know if the right word is smoothly. You can probably describe in better detail what the transition was like, but did your mentor and being able to bounce ideas and questions and thoughts off of him, how much of that, the ability to do that impacted your ultimate success in the transition? Yeah, smoothly would not be a word that I would use to describe the transition. <laughs> but having a, a mentor uh, is so huge. I mean, I think anything that anybody wants to do in their life, somebody's done it in some way, shape, or form. Maybe not exactly what you want to do, but somebody's done it. And when you can follow their, as Jim Rohn that I talked about earlier said, success leaves clues. And there's, there, you're going to be able to take so many shortcuts because you're able to learn from the mistakes of the people that came before you and you're going to just be able to be more efficient with the process of, of building something new or learning a new skill. And whatever that is, it's crucial to find a, a master teacher, something that Daniel Coyle talks about in panel code and it's one of the one of the pillars of developing talent is to find a master teacher somebody who's who's done it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times so that you're able to you're able to like I said skip over the mistakes and just be more efficient with the work that you're doing. So it was it was crucial to to go have somebody like that. So what was your initial, yeah. what was your what was your initial vision with what I'm doing now? Yes, really, just to be speaking in front of as many people as I can, to be to be coaching people on an individual basis, and and really use speaking as a way to introduce to that space myself and what I bring to the table and how I can help. And then use the coaching to dive deeper individually with people who have more intimate, in-depth, more impactful relationships through the coaching. So when you get up and you start speaking in front of business people, CEOs, companies, salespeople, how is that different and how is it the same as what you were doing when you were speaking in front of a coach's clinic? It's a good question. Well, one thing that's different is I definitely prepare more when I'm speaking in the <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Um, so and that's definitely one thing. I mean, you're, you gotta be on your game when you're, when you're in front of those people. Uh, but I think as far as like, it's, it's very, it's similar. I mean, basically it's very similar to content. It's just different. Other than that, it's, there's really not a whole lot of, a lot of difference between the audiences. I mean, I've, I've definitely I've been improved significantly since my basketball coaches clinic days. And you know, a big thing is just reading the audiences, talking about resonating, what they're having in their heads, they're laughing, they're bored out of their mind. Uh, being able to to read uh, read the audience. The, I mean, but the other thing, it's, it's like it goes back to a lot of the performance principles. 
Are you fully locked in in a moment? Are you present? Are you prepared? Do you know your audience? Do you know their hopeful outcomes and what they want to achieve walking out of the room on that day? So in some ways it's different. In some ways it's, it's the same thing. So when you get a speaking gig with a particular corporation, a particular company, what does the process look like once you've actively engaged with them? Are you sitting down and meeting with your contact person and going over what the goals are that they're hoping to get out of you when you arrive and give your speech? Then are you researching the corporation, the people? Just talk a little bit about the process. Once you have the contract to go and speak, signed, sealed, and delivered, what are the next steps for you to prepare? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, really, we have a five-step process. We have a kickoff call. So prior to the event, we'll, we'll start with a call to learn their hope for outcomes and aspirations for their attendees you know, leaving the event. Uh, then we'll do a, a discovery session where we're just doing a bunch of research and interviews with the key stakeholders within the organization so that we're providing timely, actionable, and relevant insights that resonate with the audience. Uh, then if we need to, we'll do a review call just to make sure we're on the same page with the event planner or the, the person bringing us in. And obviously there's the delivery of the, of the talk or the workshop. And then afterwards, what we do that is a little bit different is we provide a mini course after the, after the event for continued learning. So we'll have all the key principles from the event that people can take and use for as long as they want to, in order to, to uh, continue the impact and the, the strategies and the exercises and the mindsets that were delivered during the talk. Got it. All right. I want to wrap up by asking you this final two-part question, and yep. it goes back to it's similar to another question that I asked you earlier, but this time we're going to relate it to what you're doing with the corporate speaking piece of it, and that is, one, what is your favorite part of what you're doing now and getting a chance to be a speaker? So what's the part of it that you enjoy the most? And then two, what part of it do you find to be the most challenging? Could be on the business side of it and just generating business. Could be through the actual presentation. Just talk to me a little bit about your biggest joy and then your biggest challenge. Great question. Uh, those are both top of mind. For biggest joy... As well, as much as I love being on stage and speaking, it's hearing the stories afterwards of how it's changed somebody's life at work, at home, whatever that is. I'll, I'll share, I don't know how much time I have, but I'll share a quick story with you about, no, go for it. about this. So in our leadership program, we take people through an exercise where they write letters of appreciation to somebody who has impacted their impacted their life and help them get to where they're at that day. And we have them write the letter and then we have a pre-stamped envelope that they can put it in and get in the mail and get it to the person or they can uh, just hand it off to them at their at work. And so I was sitting down with an attendee after an event and he said, this is, I love this exercise, but this is going to be incredibly difficult for me to give this to my boss. And I was like, why is that? And he's like, well, he's just, he's, I've been at the company for almost 20 years. He's just super demanding, he's so hard on people. He's threatening to fire people all the time, but at the same time, he's done so much for me. He's done, uh, you know, he's, he's given me all the opportunities I've had today. I've been in this industry for the last 20 years, uh, but it's, it's really difficult to show appreciation for somebody that has always been so incredibly hard on me and I never felt valued at all, ever. So he's like, but I'm gonna do it anyways. I'm gonna give him a letter. About a week later, I get an email from him and he says, you're never gonna, you're never gonna guess what happened. <laughs> so he did, he's like, I gave the letter to my boss and he changed immediately overnight. Now he's, when it used to be my way or the highway, he's asking people for info. He's giving people praise on jobs that they, he never ever would. If he would have walked into a, it was a commercial real estate, 
He said he would have walked into a, a construction site and told everybody the 9,000 things that are wrong and what they need to do better and to make sure it's right or they're going to get fired. And now he's taught walking in and telling people that they're doing a good job and things look good and making progress. And, and he's he changed just 100% overnight because I went first. I was vulnerable. I showed up and showed up with vulnerability to express how I felt about him and how he had impacted my life over the last 20 years. Right. So hearing stories like that, where you're, you know, it's obviously like all businesses are bringing people in to improve the bottom line. But at the end of the day, like for me, if I hear a story about how it's, it's impacting the human side of their business, that's what, what I do it for. And so hearing the stories of transformation, literally, like I don't use that word, that, that's a word that gets thrown around a lot is transformation. And I don't like to use it because it sounds like such a huge change, but like this literally was a transformation overnight and it was unbelievable. Uh, so the second part, the second question that you asked, what's the, the challenge, most challenging part and that has been, this has been, going into this space has been a, a life lesson. Like this is no question, one thing that I'm supposed to be doing from the standpoint of my own personal growth in the area of perfectionism. And so you, as you can imagine, getting up and speaking in front of a thousand people, that gets kicked into high gear for me. And so this is a, a practice for me to be able to let that go, to be in the moment, to not let my performance on stage in front of people define how I feel about myself as a human being and not place my identity in external things that I don't really control. And that has been the hardest thing for me is, is working on that perfectionism aspect of getting out and seeking that makes total sense. And I love the story. I just want to make one comment that what I liked about it was the fact that, yeah, you had an impact on the first guy who shared the letter with his boss. Then you had an impact on the guy who was the boss. But not only that, because the boss changed the way he went about doing things, you had an impact on untold number of lives of the people who came into contact with that boss every single day. And so there's a case where you paid it forward and had that, you know, had the employee not shared that story with you, you would have never known that it had gotten paid forward well beyond the people that you actually spoke to. And I think that's where the power lies. And that's whether you're doing corporate speaking or whether you're coaching. That's one of the things that I think we all who are in the people business and whether you're in the basketball business or in the speaking business, we're all, as you said, in the people business then yeah. you're having that kind of impact. And that's great stuff. Before we wrap up, Mike, I want to give you a chance to share where people can reach out to you. Where can they find you on social media? Just give all your contact information and where people can find out more about you and what you're doing. And then I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Okay, cool. Yeah, you guys can find me on LinkedIn or Instagram at who is Mike Lee. There was a million other Mike Lee variations <laughs> taken already. So that was the best one that I could come up with. So you can find me on there, LinkedIn and Instagram. Who is Mike Lee? We'd love to connect with you. you can, our website is mindshiftlabs.com. If you want to drop me an email, it's just mike at mindshiftlabs.com. Love to connect with anybody and help out in any way that possibly can. Mike, we can't thank you enough for spending some time with us tonight and taking the opportunity to come on the Hoopheads podcast and share all the things that you've been able to do, not only in the game of basketball, but as you've shifted into the corporate speaking space, having an impact on people and trying to get them un to understand the importance of mindfulness. So we thank you for that. Really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Coaches, we've teamed up with E3 Analytics so you can now purchase three of their exclusive new playbooks. If you're looking for ways to improve your team next season, these playbooks blend affordability with the quality content that serious coaches are looking for. Just visit hoopheadspod.com store 
and you'll find playbooks from Coach Don Showalter of USA Basketball, Coach Mike Flynn from the Illawarra Hawks in Australia, who coached LaMelo Ball last season, and Coach Tyler Whitcomb from West Michigan Aviation Academy. Check out these great resources at hoopheadspod.com slash store. Thanks for listening to the Hoopheads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.